praise God forevermore. Um, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, we glorify your name. We thank you so much for this season, this crossover season, Lord God, into what you're doing for 2024. This incubation time, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. This is a, this is a really good, sensitive, delicate time of year, always. Running up to, uh, there's a, a Jewish festival called Rosh Hashanah, which actually, they call it the Jewish New Year. But really, if you read the book of Exodus, thank you, team. Thank you ever so much. Uh, if you read the book of Exodus, the Bible talks about the first month on the 14th day of the month, you shall celebrate the feast of Passover. So the first month of the Jewish year is in the springtime. And uh, that's when the Passover is 14 days in is the Passover. And I think this coming year, that is somewhere around the 22nd of uh, April. So we'll be back from our trip to Israel. If you've never been to, how many of you have never been to Israel? My, my. It's special. And there's something about being in the land and seeing places like the house of Simon the Tanner that Pastor Godfrey spoke about earlier on during, during the offering. Like we can, there's a steps leading down to the house of Simon the Tanner. And you can sit there and you can just feel the presence of God. It's the most amazing thing. And one of the things that struck me, and this is where geography comes in, is that when you're in the land and you realize the distances that people traveled, you realize things like when, when those three angels appeared to uh, Cornelius, Cornelius was in Caesarea. And Caesarea Philippi is down, down a good way from the coast. In fact, from Caesarea Philippi to the house of Simon the Tanner and back is a 24-hour journey back then. Now, where can't you and I get to in 24 hours? Wow. There's no place you can't get to on this planet in 24 hours now. So the equivalent would be Somebody says, uh, you know, an angel appears in your room and says, uh, go to Sydney, Australia, to the house of so-and-so in King's Cross, Sydney. And he's, he's, he's praying there. He's waiting for you. Can you imagine? How many of you wouldn't even go? Because it's like, whoa, Australia, that's 24 hours away. So is that. Amazing, isn't it? The way we think. It's amazing. Praise Jesus. <laughs> And, and so you, you get to grasp with all the, the geography and history of the place when you go. Uh, another thing that struck me was the, um, oh gosh, well there's, there, there's so much. But the distance from uh, Capernaum where Jesus was. Jesus had a house in Capernaum, Mark chapter 2 verse 1. The Bible says, and it was recorded, that Jesus was at home. In fact, the four guys, you remember there were four guys carrying their friend, uh, and the house was packed. Jesus was preaching, and they opened the roof. That was Jesus' house. Imagine if somebody came to your house with a shovel, climbed up onto your roof. You're preaching. You're holding a cell meeting or whatever, and the next thing you hear, doom, doom. And the roof caves in, and down comes this paralytic guy. I would be creating paralytics rather than praying for one. Do you know what I mean? You just ruined my roof, man. What's wrong? I'm going to pray for your friend. Pray for yourself. But so all of those kind of things. So uh, that was a nine-hour journey back in the day from Nazareth to Capernaum. Nine hours. Amazing, isn't it? Like we can do it, we can do it in less than an hour on a coach. So there's all these things that just brings the Bible to a new level of life. Uh, when we prayed, there's something about praying on Mount Carmel. Baby love, if you wanna if you wanna really 
like sense the presence and the anointing of God in an amazing way. When we, pray, when we prayed and when we kneeled and we called upon the God of Elijah in that place, man, there's nothing. I really, really want to encourage you to go. And uh, the details will be on Harvest News Network or, or else uh, on our YouTube feed. Or you can just bribe Godfrey 200 quid. It's a non-refundable deposit. The, the rest has got to be in by November. And uh, it would be just wonderful to see you there. A lot of people don't know that Jesus had two homes. It's interesting, isn't it? We think of Jesus like the Son of Man has got no place to lay his head, etc. But there's, there's a prosperity to our Lord and Savior that the Bible actually records in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 9. It says, although he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might become, become rich. And of course, his poverty was at the cross. So we would say that this exchange of his prosperity for our poverty happened at the cross of Jesus Christ. So it's one of the four major blessings of the cross that we look at. Salvation, healing, prosperity, and ambassadorship. And all of those divine exchanges happened at the cross. How many of you know that Jesus Christ died for our salvation? Yes. How many of you know that he died for our healing? Yes. How many of you know that he died for our prosperity? Yes. How many of you know that he died for our ambassadorship? Yes. Great. So it's really important that we get the fullness of the cross. You know, Paul the Apostle said this. He said, I preach Christ crucified. And then he went on to preach about all of those things that, that Christ died for on the cross for us. And I've been praying a lot because... I've, I've noticed in the body of Christ that there is a barrier. There's an unspoken barrier that many of us can have in relation to the uh, prosperity that God wants to give us. And it works, it works this way, right? Okay. Secondhand car. That's okay. New car. Hmm, maybe. New flash car. Oh, gosh. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Couldn't have that. Or in relation to accommodation, right? Uh, Two-bedroom flat. Fine. Three-bedroom flat. Fine. Four-bedroom house. Hmm, if you need it. Mansion. Oh, no, 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 no. And we, we set unspoken parameters on ourselves. And I've been digging into the source of those parameters because there's certain things that, can you imagine if God wants to give them to us, but we don't want to receive them, how that would make you as a parent feel? You imagine if I wanted to give my children something, they say, oh, no, 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 that's far too nice. I'll have the rubbish one. It's like, what kind of, and if I, being evil, know how to give good gifts to my children, then how much more our Heavenly Father, right? So every hindrance, just say it out loud, in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus every, hindrance every hindrance to my prosperity, to my, prosperity, to my, blessing, to my blessing, be broken, be broken in, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. It's really, really important. And I want us to start here. This was one major hindrance in my life. And I want to share that with you because it really, it used to scare me when I used to read about this. Uh, let's have a look at Luke chapter 16. And we're going to start with verse number 19. Luke 16, 19. This is Jesus telling a story about a certain rich man. Now, there's, there's, certain, in the, there's certain stories in Scripture that Jesus presents to us as parables. And then there are other scriptures that Jesus will tell a story where the people will know who he's talking about. And I actually believe that this is one of those because he describes this guy to a T. He describes how many brothers he had. And he talked about uh, the, the spirit of adultery previously to that. And so like, if, if you forensically put those bits together, you can think, oh, 
Do you know what? He's talking, in, in fact, about a particular individual that probably everyone who was listening to him knew. Ah, I bet he's talking about such and such, right? So he, in verse number 19, he starts here. He says, now there was a rich man, and he habilit, habili, habitually dressed. It's amazing. It's not just me. He habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. What does the King James say? He fared sumptuously. And a, and a poor man, next verse, and a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores. Now look at the next verse. He says, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Keep going. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. A lot of people think that Peter runs heaven, but really it's Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Look at this next verse. Man, this used to scare me. Scared me. In Hades or in hell, the King James says, he lifted up his eyes. So he had eyes in hell. Being in torment, torment and saw Abraham. You think about this. He knew this guy is, is uh, what? Abraham was 2,000 years before this guy is on the planet. But when he saw Abraham, he recognized him. I saw Isaac in a vision once. I knew it was Isaac. I know, I know in my spirit what Abraham looks like, even though I've never seen him. There's a guy, there's a guy Pastor Reuben in Los Angeles, uh, a, a Russian pastor, he, he, and, and he looks like Abraham. I said to him, I, I said, you look like Abraham. He just looks like, I know what Abraham looks like. Never seen the guy, but I know, I know what he looks like. And this guy saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. Keep going. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. So this was a child of Abraham, right? Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Next verse. Think about this before we read this next verse as well. Something this morning I was praying about this and I just saw something. Now this guy according to Jesus Christ, was in hell 2,000 years ago. Every day that ticks by, that guy is still there. Right. Nudge your neighbor, tell him, don't go to hell. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus' bad things. And I thought to myself, oh, Lord, what? You mean I could go to hell for enjoying good things? Because at the surface, if this was the only parable, and this is why we've always, life changes, we've always got to interpret and understand Scripture in the light of all the other Scriptures. Yeah. Because Scripture is one massive, hyperlinked library of books yeah. that has, uh, uh, what was it? There was something like, uh, I can't remember all the interconnections between the scriptures, somebody has, has calculated them or they've done some uh, artificial intelligence thing to calculate how many scriptures are connected to other scriptures. And it's in, it's in the hundreds of thousands of connections. Hyperlinked library of books is the best definition of the Bible that I've ever heard. And Lazarus, bad things, but now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. Next verse. And besides all this, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. And look at this then. Then he says, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. Keep going. For I have five brothers. You see, Jesus is talking about a specific individual here. He said, a certain rich young ruler. I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not come also to this place of torment. Next verse. But Abraham said, now listen to this. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. But this was what caused confusion to me initially, right? 
Because if you read Moses, if you read the, cha- uh, the, the 28th chapter of the book of Moses, which is uh, of uh, the book of uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, it's uh, the, the great thing about the uh, 28th chapter of Deuteronomy is that it's a condensation of all the five books of the law into one chapter. And the first 15 or 16 verses, I think it's 15, are full of blessing. And then from verse 15 to something like 54 is all about the curse. And thank God the Bible says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Amen. Amen. So we're no longer under that curse. But the blessing of Abraham, he said, Galatians, what was it, 3.14, he says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, right? So that's us being brought in by that covenant that we celebrated today, the body and blood of the Lord and, and, and Savior Jesus Christ. By that covenant, we have been brought in to the blessing of Abraham. So Moses wants us to be blessed. He says, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and do all that he has commanded you to do, the Lord will set you high above the nations of the earth. You'll you'll be blessed coming in. You'll be blessed going out. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the country. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be your offspring and your kind and and all your increase. He says, you'll be the head and not the tail above and not beneath, the lender to many nations, and what? Not the borrower. So financial blessing is in the book of Moses. But it almost sounds like a contradiction, because here's Abraham, and it looks on the surface as though this guy is being judged for being rich. But then everything Abraham says is a contradiction to that. Right? Right? Or everything Moses has said, rather. And then he says, the prophets. Well, the Bible says what? He says, believe your prophets and so shall you what? So shall you prosper. So the prophets are saying that you should prosper. Do you see what I mean? So this was the battle going on on the inside of me for years. Like, is is prosperity a good thing or is it not a good thing? For we know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8 and, uh, and verse 9, he says, for we know. The favor of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that although he was rich, yet for our sakes he, he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. So there's a real, do you understand the paradox here? I mean, there's a guy in hell, and it looks like he's in hell because he was rich. So I was, I was praying about that. Lord, how do we conquer this? And this is what the word of the Lord came to me. You talk about settling something. He said, how many people were there? I said, well, there was Abraham, there was the rich man, and there was Lazarus. And God asked me this question. Who was the richest one among the three? Abraham, by a country mile, was richer than the rich guy who was in hell although it looked like he was in hell. because So he couldn't have been in hell because he was rich. And in fact, in fact, there's another thing. Because you see, if you're going to prosper, you've got to argue for it. When somebody pulls out and says, ha, huh, you, you, well, there's only two of you, and you're living in a six-bedroom house. What's wrong with you? You've got to have an answer. It's like somebody, somebody came to, uh, uh, to Prophet Nana in, in Ghana. He says, we know, we know your house. We know that you're living in such luxury. How do you justify this luxury that you live in? He said, well, he said, in America, you can go to Los Angeles, and there's a place called Skid Row. And everybody in Skid Row is broke. Living on the city. If you see people bent over on fentanyl and all that kind of stuff, that's Skid Row, downtown LA. And he said, that's the richest country in the world, and yet there's poor people there. This is one of the poor pe- poorest countries in the world, but there's rich people here, and I'm one of them, because God made me rich. Amen. I said, wow, that's a good argument, sir. Enjoy your wealth. Enjoy your prosperity. And then you think about, like, it's not only Moses and the prophets, but it's Proverbs as well, and, and the Psalms. 
The blessing of the Lord makes you what? Rich. Yeah. And, and in fact, you see, here's, here's, here's one of the things. I mean, we need to bash poverty. Look at what the, the Bible says in verse 25 of Luke 16. Luke 16, 25. Right in the midst of the story of the rich man and Lazarus, God says this. He says, but child, remember that during your life, you received what? Good things. So, so according to Abraham, prosperity is a what? A good thing. And look at this, even further. You see, it's, it's, we have to any double-mindedness concerning God's mandate and God's call for us to prosper can become a hindrance to our prosperity. So we've got to destroy every stronghold, every stronghold. Look what he, so he calls prosperity a good thing. In your life, you received good thing, but look what he calls poverty. Bad and things. likewise, Lazarus, what? Bad, Bad things. things. So say it out loud. Poverty, poverty. according to my father Abraham, is a bad thing. Yeah. We've got to settle this. We have to. If it's going to be, if it's going to be what God gives us, if it's going to be, like I love that word, it's a French word, but we've anglicized it to talk about a successful business person. We use the word, what? Entrepreneur. And it's from two French words. Entree, which means to enter, and prendre, which means to take. So an entrepreneur is one who enters and takes. So there's an anointing. There is an anointing, my brother and sister. I said there is an anointing to enter and take. So what is it then? Where is this, where is this uh, contradiction coming from? Where is this should I, shouldn't I prosper? Where is this thing? Because, you see, if, if God be for me, right? The Bible says, who can be against me? Right. But if you're not sure whether God is for you or not, then how can you go to battle if you're not sure whether your rear guard is covered? Whoa. That's a dodgy place to be. So we've got to know. We've got to settle it. I know that if sickness tries to come on my life, I know it's not God. I, I am thoroughly convinced Amen. that it's not God. Amen. Surely, he, has he bore my griefs. He carried my sorrows. The chastisement necessary for us to obtain peace was laid upon him, and by his wounds I am healed. There is no shadow of doubt in my mind and in my life, Amen. no shadow whatsoever, that God is is for my healing. Amen. No doubt. God is my living witness Amen. that there is no doubt. I know that God is my healer. I know that his desire for me is healing. Amen. I know it. It's settled. Yes. And by the, the, the wonderful mercy and favor of God, I know that it's my heavenly Father's will for me to prosper and be in health, even as my soul prospers. Amen. Praise Jesus forever. Amen. Praise God forever. Amen. Praise God forever. Just as surely as my salvation has been bought, just as surely as my healing and my well-being and my divine health and my divine life has been bought, just as surely as those things, my prosperity is assured in Christ. But here's a warning, you see. That you, prosperity is the only blessing of the cross of Jesus Christ that comes with a warning. And it's because of the difference between being wealthy and being rich. I want us to look at the book of James. And here's the, you see, there's a, there's a risk. He says, when you enter when you, pl when you plant houses, when you plant vineyards, and God gives you all these magnificent things. He says in Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, he says, be very careful 
to remember the Lord your God because it is he who gives you power to get wealth in order that he may establish his covenant. So the establishment of his covenant is proportionate to the wealth that he wants to give you. And that means that a portion of that wealth belongs to God. And that's the risk. That's the, that's, the, that's the difference between you having wealth and wealth having you. Does that make sense? Look at what, look at what the Bible says in James uh, chapter 2. And we'll start at the first verse. Because there's more warnings. There's more warnings about our covenant of prosperity than there is of any of the other three blessings of the cross. And that's because wealth is a risky thing to handle. Who is it, who's it said? Was it Mark Twain? He says, uh, wealth makes a great slave but a horrible master. That's a good way to look at it. Look at, what, look at what can happen in the heart of an individual. This is James or Jacob originally, the, the half-brother of Jesus, writing to the body of Christ. And he says in verse 1, he says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes to your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing fine clothes, and you say, you sit here in a good place, and to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom with which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality... You are committing sin and convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point shall be guilty of the whole law. And so there's a warning. There's a warning that suddenly, whoa, to them. Where God prospers them and then suddenly they isolate themselves based on the, a person's individual wealth or lack of. We were ministering on Friday night about the spirit of division, and we were dealing with that racist spirit head on. But you see, there's also other things that the devil tries to create to divide people. And that is, is the, the, the wealth thing. And that must never, thank God, we've never had a trace of it in harvest. There was the odd kind of wealth clique, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, but God dealt with them and removed them. But we must never allow something like that to take root. It can't take root in our heart. We've got to be the same with, with a five- or six-year-old kid as we would with an ambassador or a national president or anything like that. Because God, the Bible says, God is not one to show partiality. That's what Peter said when he visited the house of Cornelius the centurion. He says, wow, God is no respecter of persons. Round about Acts chapter 10, round about the 38th, 40th verse. He says, I know that the Lord is not one to show partiality. So we must make sure. In fact, say it out loud. In the name of Jesus Christ, name of Jesus Christ however, prosperous I get, however prosperous I get, I shall never see myself, I shall never see myself as greater than anyone who hasn't got that level. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. I hope this morning, I hope something has settled in your heart concerning whether God wants you prosperous. Because the way the devil used that scripture against, you know, God, the, the devil will use the Bible against you. He did it against Jesus Christ, tried three times. And there's certain things that you have to wrestle and really dig. And I'm so glad I dug because now I'm not afraid to prosper. If I pull up in a Ferrari or a Rolls Royce because the devil stole my other car, what would you say? Oh, or would you say, hallelujah, look at what the Lord has done. Yeah. 
Because those things don't matter. The Ferrari and the Range Rover and the, the Porsche or the Lambo or whatever is going the same way. The Bible says it's going to all be destroyed by fire. It doesn't matter how lovely and bling your house is. It's going to be destroyed by fire. How much of it can you bring with you? Nothing. No. So our prep in reality is for the next life. But the Bible says that God wants to give us freely all things to enjoy. And we must allow him to bless us in the way that he wants to. He's a good, good father. And he wants to bless us. Would you stand to your feet right now? Would you thank him? Would you thank him for the prosperity that you have so far? For the blessing that you have so far? Would you just open your mouth and thank him for where you're at? Where you're at now was a testimony once. Father, we thank you so much. You give us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We thank you for the blessing. We thank you for good things, Heavenly Father. Lord God, may we never fall in to the trap of the rich man. May we always remember the poor. May we always be givers. May we always, Father, give you your portion. The glory due your name, the tithe, the offering, whatever you plant in our hearts to give you, Lord, that we would always be generous towards you, Heavenly Father. In the realm of sacrifice, Lord God, that we would always be really good sacrifices, like our father Abraham. Lord God, thank you, Heavenly Father, for that covenant relationship. Lord God, we bless the holy name of Jesus and we thank you for your word of prosperity to us today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to today's message. We hope it ministers to you and blesses you throughout the week and further along. Have a blessed week and God bless. Thank you.